Stephen Randall Glass is a former U.S. journalist who achieved notoriety in 1998 when it was revealed that as much as half of his published articles were fabrications. Over a three-year period as a young rising star at the New Republic from 1995 to 1998, Glass invented quotations, sources, and even entire events in articles he wrote for that magazine and others. Most of Glass's articles were of the entertaining and humorous type. Some were based entirely on fictional events. His career at TNR was dramatized in the film Shattered Glass, where Glass was portrayed by Hayden Christensen. Glass fictionalized his own story in The Fabulist, a 2003 novel whose protagonist is named Stephen Aaron Glass. Glass holds a degree in law from Georgetown University Law Center, and, since 2004, has worked as a paralegal at the Beverly Hills law firm of Carpenter, Zuckerman and Rowley. While Glass has passed the bar exam in both New York and California, he withdrew his application to become a licensed attorney in New York in 2004 after he was advised it would not succeed, and in 2014 the California Supreme Court unanimously ruled that he should not be licensed in that state. Early life and education, Glass grew up in a Jewish family in the northern Chicago suburb of Highland Park. He attended the University of Pennsylvania, where he was an executive editor of the student newspaper, The Daily Pennsylvanian. His tenure coincided with a spectacular incident that befell the newspaper, an entire edition was stolen by students who objected to the newspaper's coverage and the comments of its columnists. In addition, the infamous Water Buffalo incident occurred during his tenure, bringing national attention to Penn campus events. After his graduation, Glass joined the New Republic in 1995 as an editorial assistant. Soon thereafter, the 23-year-old advanced to writing features. While employed full-time at the New Republic, he also wrote for other magazines including Policy Review, George, Rolling Stone, and Harper's and contributed to Public Radio International's weekly hour-long program This American Life, hosted by Ira Glass. The New Republic Affair Though Glass enjoyed loyalty from the New Republic staff, his reporting repeatedly drew outraged rebuttals from the subjects of his articles, eroding his credibility and leading to private skepticism from insiders at the New Republic. After the scandal broke, the magazine's majority owner and editor-in-chief, Martin Peretz, admitted that his wife had told him that she did not find Glass's stories credible and had stopped reading them. In the end, Glass's final editor at TNR, Charles Lane, was instrumental in exposing Glass's fraudulent writing. Warning signs, in December 1996, the Center for Science in the Public Interest was the target of a hostile Glass article called Hazardous to Your Mental Health. CSPI wrote a letter to the editor and issued a press release pointing out numerous inaccuracies and distortions, and even hinted at possible plagiarism. The organization Drug Abuse Resistance Education accused Glass of falsehoods in his March 1997 article Don't You D.A.R.E. In May 1997, Joe Galli of the College Republican National Committee wrote a letter to the editor accusing Glass of fabrications in Spring Breakdown, his lurid tale of drinking and debauchery at the 1997 Conservative Political Action Conference. A June 1997 article called Peddling Poppy about a Hofstra University conference on George H. W. Bush drew a letter to the editor from Hofstra reciting Glass's errors. The New Republic, however, stood by and defended him. Editor Michael Kelly wrote an angry letter to CSPI calling them liars and demanding that they apologize to Glass. Scandal breaks, when Glass was finally caught in May 1998. He had risen to become an associate editor at TNR. The story that triggered his downfall, in the issue dated May 18, 1998, was Hack Heaven. It concerned a supposed 15 year old hacker who intruded into the computer network of a company called Juck Micronics, which allegedly then hired him as an information security consultant. As with several of Glass's previous stories, Hack Heaven depicted events that were almost cinematically vivid and told in present tense implying that Glass was there as the action took place. The article opened as follows. Ian Restall, a 15-year-old computer hacker who looks like an even more adolescent version of Bill Gates, is throwing a tantrum. I want more money. I want a Miata. I want a trip to Disney World. 
I want X-Men comic, book number one. I want a lifetime subscription to Playboy Euro, and throw in Penthouse. Show me the money. Show me the money. Across the table, executives from a California software firm called Ducked Micronics are listening and trying ever so delicately to oblige. Excuse me, sir, one of the suits says tentatively to the pimply teenager. Excuse me. Pardon me for interrupting you, sir. We can arrange more money for you. Upon the publication of Hack Heaven, Adam Penenberg, a reporter with Forbes, undertook to verify it, initially to find out how TNR had managed to scoop Forbes. Penenberg found no evidence that Jack Micronics or any of the people mentioned in the story existed. When Penenberg and Forbes confronted TNR, Glass claimed to have been duped. Lane had Glass travel with him to Bethesda, Maryland, to visit the Hyatt Hotel where Restel had supposedly met with the Juck Micronics executives and the room where the conference had supposedly been held. Despite Glass's assurances, Lane discovered that on the day of the alleged meeting the conference room had been closed. Afterwards, Lane dialed a Palo Alto number for Juck Micronics provided by Glass and eventually had a phone conversation with a man who identified himself as George Sims, a Juck executive. This was the first piece of evidence substantiating Glass' article. However, Lane learned from a passing remark by another TNR editor that Glass had a brother at Stanford University, located in Palo Alto. Realizing that Glass's brother was posing as Sims, Lane immediately fired Glass. Lane offered this explanation for the scandal. We extended normal human trust to someone who basically lacked a conscience. We busy, friendly folks were no match for such a willful deceiver. We thought Glass was interested in our personal lives, or our struggles with work, and we thought it was because he cared. Actually, it was all about sizing us up and searching for vulnerabilities. What we saw as concern was actually contempt. Aftermath, Tiena subsequently determined that at least 27 of 41 stories written by Glass for the magazine contained fabricated material. Some of the 27, such as Don't You Dare, contained real reporting interwoven with fabricated quotations and incidents, while others, including Hack Heaven, were completely made up. In the process of creating the Hack Heaven article, Glass had gone to especially elaborate lengths to thwart the discovery of his deception by TNR's fact-checkers, creating a shill website and voicemail account for Jack Micronics. Fabricating Notes of Story Gathering having fake business cards printed, and even composing editions of a fake computer hacker community newsletter. As for the balance of the 41 stories, Lane, in an interview given for the 2005 DVD edition of the 2003 movie Shattered Glass, said, in fact, I'd bet lots of the stuff in those other 14 is fake too. It's not like we're vouching for those 14, that they're true. They're probably not either. The magazine's Rolling Stone, George, and Harper's also re-examined his contributions. Rolling Stone and Harper's found the material generally accurate yet maintained they had no way of verifying information because Glass had cited anonymous sources. George discovered that at least three of the stories Glass wrote for it contained fabrications. Specifically, Glass fabricated quotations in a profile piece and apologized to the article's subject, Vernon Jordan an advisor to then-President Bill Clinton. A court filing for Glass's application to the California bar gave an updated count on his journalism career, 36 of his stories at the New Republic were said to be fabricated in part or in whole, along with three articles for George, two articles for Rolling Stone, and one for Policy Review. Later work, after journalism, Glass earned a law degree, magna cum laude, at Georgetown University Law Center. He then passed the New York State Bar Exam in 2000, but the Committee of Bar Examiners refused to certify him on its moral fitness test, citing ethics concerns related to the TNR affair. He later abandoned his efforts to be admitted to the bar in New York. In 2003 Glass published a so-called biographical novel, The Fabulist. Glass sat for an interview with the weekly news program 60 Minutes Time to coincide with the release of his book. The New Republic's literary editor, Leon Wiseltier, complained, the creep is doing it again. 
even when it comes to reckoning with his own sins, he is still incapable of non-fiction. The careerism of his repentance is repulsively consistent with the careerism of his crimes. One reviewer of The Fabulist commented, The irony Euro we must have irony in a tale this tawdry our Euro is that Mr. Aglass is abundantly talented. He's funny and fluent and daring. In a parallel universe, I could imagine him becoming a perfectly respectable novelist a Euro a prize winner, perhaps, with a bit of luck. Also in 2003, Glass briefly returned to journalism, writing an article about Canadian marijuana laws for Rolling Stone. On November 7, 2003, Glass participated in a panel discussion on journalistic ethics at George Washington University, along with the editor who had hired him at the New Republic, Andrew Sullivan, who accused Glass of being a serial liar, who was using contrition as a career move. In October 2003, a feature film about the TNR scandal, Shattered Glass, directed by Billy Ray and starring Hayden Christensen as Glass and Peter Sarsgaard as Charles Lane, was released. The movie, appearing shortly after the New York Times suffered a similar scandal to the one that Shattered Glass portrayed, occasioned critiques of the journalism industry itself by nationally prominent journalists such as Frank Rich and Mark Bowden. It presented a stylized view of Glass' rise and fall. Glass has been out of the public eye since the release of his novel and Ray's film. In 2007 he was performing with a Los Angeles comedy troupe known as On Cabaret and was described by Billy Ray as being employed at a law firm, apparently as a paralegal. Unsuccessful California bar application, Glass later applied to join the bar in California. In 2009, the committee of bar examiners again refused to certify him finding that he did not satisfy California's moral fitness test because of his history of journalistic deception. Insisting that he had reformed, Glass then petitioned the state bar court's hearing department, which found that Glass possessed the necessary good moral character to be admitted as an attorney. The committee of bar examiners sought review in the state bar's review department. The committee of bar examiners filed a writ of review, thereby petitioning the California Supreme Court to review the decision. On November 16, 2011, the Supreme Court granted the petition, the first time in 11 years the court has granted review in a moral character case. On January 3, 2012, Glass attorneys filed papers in the Supreme Court arguing that his behavior has been irreproachable for over 13 years and is proof that he has reformed. On November 6, 2013 the California Supreme Court heard arguments in Glass's case, and ruled unanimously against him in an opinion issued January 27, 2014. The lengthy opinion describes in minute detail the applicant's history, record, the bar's applicable standard of review, the appeal, and its own analysis of how Glass failed to satisfy the court's standards, concluding on this record. He has not sustained his heavy burden of demonstrating rehabilitation and fitness for the practice of law. Based on this decision, Glass will not be allowed to practice law in the state of California. References, Notes Further reading, Chet, Jonathan. Remembrance of Things Past, How My Friend Stephen Glass Got Away With It. Washington Monthly, July-August 2003. New Republic, The Editors, To Our Readers, June 1, 1998, and to our readers, a report, June 29, 1998, Rosin, Hannah. Glass Houses. Slate, May 21, 2003. Salon.com. Hacker Heaven, Editor's Hell, May 14, 1998. Forbes. Lies, Damn Lies in Fiction, May 11, 1998. Forbes continued from Lies. Damn Lies in Fiction, May 11, 1998. Forbes. The New York Times Scandal Recalls Glass Episode, May 20, 2003. Rick McGuinness Website. A Tissue of Lies, The Stephen A. Glass Index A Euro Complete List of Glass Articles, with Known Fabrications Marked. The American Life audio segment that discusses an article by Glass about his time as a telephone psychic and about lying to strangers. Glass articles, many of the articles that Glass wrote for the New Republic are no longer available online. Below are links to some of those articles which Glass is suspected of fabricating in part or in whole, a day on the streets, for the Daily Pennsylvanian, 
June 6, 1991, Taxi Cabs and the Meaning of Work, August 5, 1996, Mrs. Colyell thanks God for private social security, June 1997, for Policy Review magazine. PDF format. Probable Clause, published January 6 and 13, 1997, Holy Trinity, published January 27, 1997, Don't You Dare, published March 3, 1997, Writing on the Wall, published March 24, 1997, Slavery Chic, published July 14 and 21, 1997, The Young and the Feckless, published September 15, 1997, see also, Journalism Scandals, Shaparagraph and Scandal.